Hello, welcome to another platform engineering video. Um, now that we know how we can set up encryption on Linux, let's find out how we can crack it using quantum computing. I am joined by James Birney, a principal consultant. And James, do you want to say a few words, introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, thanks very much for having me, George. Um, my name's James, I'm James Burney. Uh, at the moment, I work for a company called Codurance. We're a small consultancy. I'm a principal consultant there. Um, for four or five years before that, I worked for ThoughtWorks, um, which is a bigger consultancy. What I've been doing as a consultant is mainly working in companies that um, need some help to get their delivery organization uh, working well, So, which I find interesting and fun. Usually, um, uh, we have a saying that if your biggest problem is a technology problem, you probably don't need us and you definitely don't need me. So that's the type of environment I like to work in. And for 10 years or so before that, I worked uh, in a startup. Um, obviously, it wasn't a startup for 10 years, but it was when I started there. Um, going right back to sort of uh, the mid 2000s. And um, I'm, I've been working in software since the, the mid 1990s. And I always say that uh, when I started working in software, TDD was something you studied, but you never did. Um, <laughs> so so that, that's a function of how old I am. Um, so I just about still write software. Uh, and I think we'll probably touch on it in this, this talk. But um, uh, these days, most of the software I write is, is using quantum computers, which I just do for fun. Uh, so yeah, thanks for having me, George. Excellent. Um, James, why are intelligence agencies storing data for later processing? Okay, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I, I can answer that by talking about a little bit of, of history, really. Um, if we look at the history of encryption, of, of um, software encryption, um, it goes back to the mid-1970s. There was a a paper published by um, Rivest, Shamir, and Abelman, uh, which became the RSA. That's where RSA comes from, those three gentlemen. That paper was published in, I think it was 1976. So that's where people would say that's, that's where we can trace back the origins of, of the way that we encrypt data now. However, in, I think, 1997, the British government, um, when they released some official secrets, uh, told the world that in fact a team of uh, software developers, uh, well cryptologists at GCHQ in the UK had created something that was almost identical to RSA and had been using it for several years before RSA was publicly known. And what that tells us is that um, intelligence agencies all over the world will not tell us what their technological breakthroughs are. So I think it's fair to say that they are um, you know, advancing technology in, in cryptography as we speak. And the thing about the way that we exchange data, exchange messages with RSA is that those messages, uh, they, don't, they don't have a shelf life in the sense that they don't decay over time. Uh, so what, it's, it's the belief of many of us in the industry that what's happening is that the intelligence agencies are essentially just harvesting and storing all of those messages that we're exchanging around the world at the moment. Um, because that's perfectly possible to do. The channels are not secured. It's actually the messages themselves that are secured. So they are, we believe they're holding all those messages until such a time that they will be able to decrypt them. Okay. And you believe that there will be value when they are able to decrypt them for them? Well, I, I, I think so, because uh, if we know that um, intelligence agencies are, are always on the lookout for terrorists, um, it primarily is, is what we hear a lot about. And um, whilst they might not be able to decrypt those messages today, because they'll be encrypted using uh, probably 2048-bit or 3072-bit RSA keys, um, the assumption is that at some point in the future, they'll be able to read those messages. So therefore, uh, why wouldn't they store them? There's uh, the, the cost of computer storage is, is trivially cheap these days. So um, absolutely, I, I think every intelligence agency all over the world would be um, probably uh, not doing its duty if it wasn't saving all those messages. Okay. Can you tell us a bit about the performance capabilities of quantum computing? So in theory, if, you, if a quantum computer can do more calculations, uh, it has more chances of decrypting data without having the key. Yeah, so it's, it's not quite, um, I've, I've read in a few places or when I, when I chat to people, people say, oh, well, is a quantum computer just a really, really powerful computer? Um, well, it is a powerful computer, but it's not 
just the fact that it's it's a, a classical computer on steroids because uh, it actually works in a very different way. Um, now you would have to, I don't think we've probably got time today to talk about it, but um, uh, you'd have to understand a bit of quantum physics and a bit of quantum mechanics. And in particular, you'd have to buy into what we call the many worlds interpretation of, uh, of quantum mechanics. But what a quantum computer can do is that a qubit um, can have both states at the same time. So just as uh, a quantum computer has qubits, a classical computer has bits, uh, a qubit, the, the real reason why a quantum computer is, is strange, different, and powerful is because all of its qubits can be simultaneously storing a zero and one. Uh, whereas, of course, in a classical computer, it's deterministically either zero or one. So what that means is if you've got an array of uh, n qubits and you use that in a calculation, then what the computer can actually do is, is perform the same calculation actually simultaneously with two to the n different values for some input. So um, what's actually happening according to David Deutsch and according to various quantum physicists is that uh, there are many parallel universes where that computation takes place in each of them. Uh, the tricky thing is that you can't actually access the results of that computation in any universe other than the one, the one you're in. And you've got no way of knowing beforehand uh, which of the input values were used in your calculation. Um, but the, the real power of the quantum computer comes because uh, each of those different computations, and, and I'm going to paraphrase slightly, is uh, there's an interference pattern which is set up between the different values of the different um, um, of, of all the qubits. So if you can find a way to design an algorithm that takes advantage of that interference pattern, then you can take advantage of the fact that there are um, many millions sometimes of, of, parallel, uh, of parallel computations taking place. Um, but it's, 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 it's not simple, it's not easy, and it's definitely not a case that it's, it's just a, uh, a classical computer that's, that's working really, really quickly. Okay, that's actually mind-bending to think about. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Um, some time ago, I posted a tweet um, about the new bit is qubit. Uh, how far are we from making that a reality? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So um, there are real quantum computers in the world at the moment. Uh, IBM has a publicly available one. Uh, I know that various other large companies are working on them. There's a company uh, based in California called Rigetti that has real quantum computers that it's, uh, it leases out, you know, on sort of cloud type thing. Um, however, um, none of these computers yet is big enough in the sense that it doesn't have enough qubits to do um, many useful calculations. Um, Google last year, in March of last year, claimed that they had quantum supremacy. The definition of quantum supremacy, uh, I don't really like that phrase, but that's the one that got purchased in, in, the, in, uh, in the media, is that there exists a real world algorithm that can be solved more efficiently uh, in a in a real quantum computer, in a working quantum computer, than it can be solved in a in a classical computer. Um, that claim that Google made was then obviously challenged by the other players in the industry. And uh, as far as I know, they haven't managed to. You know, th there is no consensus on quantum supremacy yet. Um, but that what that did do was lead to more investment and more interest in quantum computers. Um, but realistically, um, for real world hard problems, um, I think we're, we're still a few ways off, um, perhaps a number of years away from there being quantum computers that can, can solve those problems. Uh, I do know that Microsoft announced about a year and a half ago um, that they expected, well I say Microsoft announced, one of the marketing people in Microsoft in a, in a press conference said that he expected there to be a working cloud quantum solution within five to 10 years. But then uh, sometime uh, shortly after that, uh, I was uh, at a meetup with um, a woman called Dr. Julie Love, who uh, is head of Microsoft Quantum Effort. And uh, she was very disappointed that that announcement had been made, to put it that way. So, so she was slightly more skeptical, but um, yeah. Optimistically speaking, perhaps within um, three to five years, we might have um, really effective quantum computers, but some people believe it will take much longer. Okay. Um, James, you shared the photo with us. Uh, what is that device next to you exactly? <laughs> and where are you in this photo? 
Um, so that photo, that's from, um, that's a place called the London Centre of Nanotechnology, LCN, which is just near Euston Station in London. Uh, I was there at a meeting for a quantum steering group, which was uh, a group that was set up uh, amongst uh, academics, industry people to um, uh, discuss and um, uh, find ways to use the investment that the government is, uh, is still making in quantum technologies. So we had the meeting and then um, we were invited to go and look in their lab. So that device behind me is, uh, was actually a cryogenic fridge. Um, that's why it, it looks a bit like a big water storage tank. Inside of that thing there, buried inside, I think uh, my understanding is they're tiny little things, is six qubits. Um, it's not actually a quantum computer. Um, but what it is, is they are, the experiments that they're running with that is they're trying to find a way to manipulate the quantum state of the qubits. So just like a uh, classical computer, which manipulates the state of uh, classical bits, which can be zeros or ones, uh, using logic gates, uh, a, a quantum computer needs to use logic gates to change the quantum state of the qubits. Um, now that's hard to do. Um, so um, because if any heat gets into the qubit, the quantum state decays. Uh, it's something called quantum decoherence kicks in and the qubit ceases to be usable and the whole thing has to be reset in a big way. So what they're doing there at uh, LCN, um, and bear in mind that I'm not a material scientist and I don't understand this particularly uh, well, is my understanding is that in order to implement the logic gates, what they're doing is they're firing a single photon of microwave energy at an ion which is suspended between electromagnets in a vacuum. And, and that's how the logic gates are implemented. So uh, that technology is, is unproven and it's still being worked on. And apparently that's, that's one of the biggest problems that quantum computers have is how to manipulate the qubits, how to implement the logic gates. And, and that's what they're doing at LCM. They're, they're trying to find a way to, to make that technology work. Okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> have you used a quantum computer? And if you have, what did you use it for? Um, so yes, um, we, so about coming up to two years ago now, um, because uh, as I mentioned, uh, I've, I've met a few people that, that work in, in the quantum computing industry. I was introduced to some people from IBM and uh, they have uh, several real quantum computers, some of which you can pay a lot of money to use and some of which are publicly available. And what we did was, uh, for one of the meetup groups in London, uh, we had a, a quantum hack day. And what we were doing was, we were doing something called quantum chemistry. Um, now, in a quantum computer, or quantum computers will be, there, there are certain classes of problem that quantum computers are very, very well suited to solve. And one of those is optimization problems. And the way that that works, the way that, the reason why it's really interesting to a lot of people is that if you imagine a, any kind of financial market system which has lots and lots of, say, share prices on any given day, um, most people here that work for investment banks or a lot of people that work for investment banks, their job is to try and find a mathematical model that will predict tomorrow's prices. Because obviously, if you can predict tomorrow's prices, you'll make an awful lot of money. And they have been for, for decades using sophisticated computer models to try and work out some way of predicting the future. Um, the problem with these models is, is that they're massively computationally inefficient. Uh, they're obviously an approximation. Uh, and uh, I, I, I doubt that they're particularly uh, accurate. Otherwise, people, you know, everybody in the world would be really rich through investment. Um, so anyway, these optimization problems are really good. They're really suited to the way that the, a quantum computer can work, essentially, and speaking, because if you think of something like a, an approximation that's trying to find a local minimum or a local maximum for a multivariate function, what a quantum computer can do is simultaneously check uh, many, many values of that function at the same time, and then notice the interference pattern between those different uh, solutions those different values and therefore make a, a much better inference about where the local minimum or local maximum might lie. Um, now, those types of problems are also uh, very, very similar to uh, quantum uh, chemistry, uh, organic chemistry. So in order to understand how a molecule is structured, 
uh, it's not enough to just know that, uh, know how many oxygen atoms, how many carbon atoms, how many hydrogen atoms and so on that it contains. Uh, in order to understand how its chemical properties work, um, you actually have to understand exactly how close they are to each other, the, the various atoms and what the angles of the bonds are and various different things. Um, because the way that uh, molecules work is that all of the atoms in, in the configuration, they will settle down into the lowest energy state. That's, that's how things work in the world. A bit like how, uh, you know, if, if you have a really bumpy room and you put a ball somewhere on, on the top of one of the little peaks, it will obviously eventually roll down into the bottom of a hole somewhere. So um, that's, that's how um, chemical um, compounds work. So what we were doing when we used the IBM computer was we were using the computer to simulate the structure of a molecule. Uh, it was actually a, a, a known molecule because the, the computers are not yet powerful enough to simulate really, really complex molecules. So we were using uh, an optimization algorithm and submitting it to the quantum computer, then getting back successively better approximations uh, to try and infer the, the exact chemical makeup of a particular compound. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we did that for, for a day and then, you know, we had our results where we were doing it in teams as one does in a, in a hackathon type thing. Um, and the reason why that type of uh, operation is, is really interesting and really exciting is that uh, we don't understand uh, complex um, organic molecules. So um, whilst we, um, I've, I've been told that the most complex molecule that we understand is caffeine, and that has, you know, it's say this big. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it's a big thing. Um, but classical computers are not powerful enough to simulate bigger molecules than that. And one of the most interesting molecules that exists is something called uh, the iron molyb uh, I can't say it, iron molybdenum complex, uh, which is actually a submolecule of some bigger organic thing. And the reason why that's interesting is because bean plants use the iron molybdenum complex to fix um, atmospheric nitrogen. Um, and then they, they take the atmospheric nitrogen and, and it turns into effectively into ammonia, which they then excrete through their roots. And this is why crop rotation works. We've known about crop rotation for centuries. You might remember studying at school. Um, so you plant beans one year, then you plant wheat the following year, then you leave the crop fallow. And the bean plants take the atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into fertilizer for the wheat, which is why you do the crop rotation. Now, um, we've known for a long, long time that ammonia is, is it's effectively a, the universal uh, fertilizer. Everybody needs it all over the world. And at the moment, the way that we make ammonia is through a process called the Harbour-Bosch process, which, was, uh, which has been around for over 100 years. Um, and, and that's a massive heavy scale industrial process that uses uh, according to some estimates up to five percent of all of the world's entire output of natural gas at any given point uh, and it's hugely costly it's hugely expensive and it's hugely polluting however the bean plant that i've described can do exactly the same thing but without all of that energy uptake and we don't understand how it does that we know it's to do with this iron molybdenum complex but we don't understand the exact chemical properties because we can't simulate that molecule so the big promise of quantum computers is that if we can get a computer that's sufficiently big enough to do this computation we will understand that and then potentially that massive massive industrial process that uh, goes on all over the world will just not be needed anymore well, i hope amazing. that answers the question i think i might have diverged a bit there but <laughs> It's very interesting to hear um, what you did in the hackathon. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I guess now it's time for the big question. Can we break encryption with quantum computing? And are there any algorithms that are more susceptible, more vulnerable to quantum computing capabilities? OK. Um, so, so the short answer is, uh, given a sufficiently powerful, sufficiently um, decent quantum computer, yes, we will be able to break encryption. So uh, in order to understand why, I guess um, just we need to understand a bit about, and I'm sure we spoke about this earlier, um, although I haven't seen it yet, how exactly does encryption work? So public key encryption, um, most of the algorithms, uh, RSA in particular, and I think elliptic curve is the same, um, they rely on the fact that it's very, very easy to multiply together two large prime numbers. Uh, but it's very hard to um, get the factors of a, of a large number. 
So the encryption key effectively is a very, very big number, which is the product of two primary numbers. Uh, sorry, two prime numbers. Um, and to factorize any number uh, using any classical computing algorithm is uh, of uh, exponential complexity. Um, well, it's actually sub-exponential, but that's the same as exponential, really. So just, just to give a sense of, of what that means, uh, most of RSA, I believe, at the moment uh, is 2,048-bit keys that we're using to exchange our information. If you take um, the most powerful quanti uh, sorry, the most powerful classical computer that currently exists, uh, they would take in the region of uh, 80 or so years to, I think, uh, or, or decades at least, to, to decrypt that key. So you can be fairly certain that under certain uh, current conditions, those keys are safe. On the other hand, if instead of using a 2048-bit key, you were to use a 3072-bit key, which some, uh, some uh, systems do use, if you could construct um, a theoretical computer which used every electron in the universe as a computational bit, it would take that theoretical computer longer than the lifetime of the universe to decrypt a 3072-bit key. So it's reasonable to assume that um, RSA uh, and similar algorithms like elliptic curve and so on are safe from attack from classical computers. However, um, given that uh, breaking those encryption algorithms is, is equivalent to uh, effectively factorizing a large number, the, the question becomes, okay, how, how efficient does there exist an algorithm in a quantum computer that, that can do that in efficient time? And it turns out that there is. Uh, there was an algorithm, there is an algorithm called Shaw's algorithm uh, developed. Uh, it was first uh, proposed uh, in the early 1990s, actually, when quantum computers were just a theoretical thing rather than a theoretical and experimental thing um, by Peter Shaw in the UK. And Shaw's algorithm um, is for factorizing large numbers, and it isn't of exponential complexity, it's of polynomial complexity. And effectively what that means is that the, the problem of, of factorization uh, stops being intractable and becomes tractable. So um, broadly speaking, uh, have we, if we could make a quantum computer that's good enough and powerful enough and has enough qubits, we can uh, break RSA. Um, and it's, it's debatable how far away that time might be. Um, but just to set it in context, the biggest known quantum computers at the moment are in the region of uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 qubits um, in, in terms of uh, compute power. Uh, in order to factorize a number, Shaw's algorithm requires about three times as many qubits as the size of the key. Therefore, for a 3072-bit uh, a, um, a key would require uh, in the region of, of 9,000 qubits. So that's some distance off, but um, I, I would hasten to add that that is known quantum computers. And as I said right at the start of this discussion, um, it, many of us believe that there are much more powerful quantum computers that are lying around either in China or, or the UK or France or, or America that, that, that exist and, and we'll only know about them in the future. Okay, so it's not impossible. Uh, good to know. Thanks for letting us know. Um, <laughs> but there are some limitations in uh, quantum computers today. For example, uh, it has to operate within uh, a specific a mm -hmm. certain temperature or it can only operate or run a program for a few seconds yeah is that still the case Abs yes absolutely so the the temperature thing is interesting um the uh, the reason why they're in uh, the thing that was behind me in that photograph is is a cryogenic fridge uh, and i know when, when i've spoken to people at ibm and if you go on the ibm uh, q experience website you'll see this they're fond of telling us that um they the um the qubits have to be cooled down to something near absolute zero. And the reason why they need to be queued, uh, cooled down to that is because heat disturbs quantum state. Uh, if you have a quantum system, which could be an ion, or it could be a photon, or it could be an electron, something like that, any type of heat um, absolutely ruins the, the, the purity of the quantum state and, and ruins it as a computational thing. Um, so those, the IBM computers, are something like, I think it's 0.2 millikelvin 
And um, the IBM people are fond of telling us that not only is that um, colder than outer space, apparently, who knew, but it's, uh, it's also, according to their publicity and according to their people, uh, the, the, the quantum computers that they have in America are the coldest thing that's ever existed in the universe. <laughs> so um, I guess that in itself is a limitation. It's, um, whilst that's known technology, cooling, super cooling things, uh, it's expensive technology. Um, but the more, uh, the real limitation is that uh, it's twofold. It's the fact that uh, in order to, unlike in a classical computer where bits are really just sort of moving things that are voltages in, in little capacitors that lie around inside the computer somewhere, and they can be assumed to be, um, they can assume to be uh, effectively have um, infinite lifetime and infinite fidelity. Uh, it's not quite infinite, but, but it, for the purposes of calculation, it's good enough. Um, that's certainly not the case in a quantum computer. So all of your qubits need to be near to all of your other qubits in order to exploit the interference patterns that I mentioned earlier. So the actual physical arrangement of them is important. Uh, and that's hard to do because, uh, you know, I think we all understand that if you've got, say, uh, 100 qubits or 1,000 qubits, how do you make all of them close to one another? It's, it's physically not possible, and, and, and they have to be in, in some sense. Otherwise, you, you can't exploit the, the computational, um, uh, well, you just can't exploit them. So that's one problem. Um, but also, uh, the bigger problem is something called quantum decoherence. So no matter how close to absolute zero you have your quantum system, every time you pass the qubits through a gate, um, well that, that's logically speaking, uh, but as I said earlier, that could be by firing a, a photon of, of microwave radiation at them. The quantum state um, leaks a bit into the gate and the gate leaks a bit into the quantum state effectively. So the quantum state is gradually getting less and less pure and more and more noisy. So there is, there is definitely, there's a physical limit of how many gates you can pass your qubits through. Um, and that technology is, is far from understood. It's a material science problem. And that, that's where, um, that's the big, big uh, current barrier to making a working quantum computer is to understand how to physically make the qubits so that they, so that you can have enough of them in a single computer to, to, to make meaningful computations, but also more importantly and more difficultly, uh, so that they can go through sufficient numbers of gates to make a meaningful uh, quantum, uh, they call them a quantum score, these programs. So, um, so you have to, we don't have enough qubits, which is in one dimension, we can't yet pass them through enough gates to make a meaningful program. So if you take the, the number of qubits and multiply it by the number of operations, that's something called quantum volume. And we're still a ways off having uh, usable quantum volumes that will uh, you know, solve real world problems. Okay. You mentioned that there are a few companies offering quantum computing uh, capabilities for people to use. Um, mm -hmm. Is it a matter of, first of all, what companies are those? And is it a matter of people signing up and writing a program using a simulator maybe how does it work okay um so yeah um ibm q experience uh is is probably the most well known and it's the one that i use for for demonstrations uh they've got a website um that any anybody can join there's a there's a free tier which gives you a number of credits for submitting your programs uh it's a bit like uh, a returning to something you know in the 1950s or 60s that uh, my dad told me about when he was at university he used to write programs on uh, on i think it was punch cards or and physically punch the holes in the punch cards and he had to travel from leeds to durham or durham to leeds i can't remember which and give those programs to somebody else and then they'd execute them on their on their big computer thing and then uh, he told me that he would go there in the morning, hand over the punch cards, then they'd go to the pub for a few hours and then come back and get the results. So uh, a bit like that. These days, uh, you can use your credits on the IBM machine. You can submit a program and it, it goes in a queue. And uh, sometime later, you'll see the results from it. Um, although you don't have to go to a pub and you don't have to get the train from Leeds to Durham. Um, so yeah, IBM Q's there. You can program that using, they have a, a, a graphical uh, interface for writing programs, um, which you, it's kind of the drag and drop, you drag and drop the logic gates onto a horizontal line, which represents the qubits. 
Uh, that also sort of transpiles in front of you into a kind of uh, Python dialect, which is um, the, the quantum program. And you can download the, um, uh, the, the Python thing from IBM. Uh, so that's, that's probably the most well-known and it, and it has a free tier, so anybody can use it. They also have subscription services for their bigger uh, quantum computers. Uh, as I, met, I mentioned earlier, a company called Wigeti, they have um, bigger quantum computers in California. You can subscribe to them, but I think that's uh, on an industrial scale that, you know, you're talking about an awful lot of money that you have to um, pay them to be allowed to use their computers. But again, it's, it's a kind of wait for your turn in the queue type thing. Uh, but if you want something accessible, you want to understand how quantum algorithms work and how to code them. Um, certainly my, my favorite way of doing that is there's something, Microsoft have got something called QIS Kit, uh, which I think is supposed to be said Kids Kit or Quiz Kit, uh, which is a, um, uh, basically um, uh, a .NET thing. Uh, you can download it free on their website and then it adds plugins to .Visual Studio Code or whatever. Uh, it's there's a language called Q sharp which is their quantum computing language uh, you can write programs in Q sharp you have to write a C sharp program or some other classical computing language program that then will call your Q sharp program and that executes on a quantum compiler uh, sorry a, a quantum simulator um, which is installed on on your own computer when you when you download QuizKit um, so that quantum simulator effectively what it's doing is it's using clever maths to to simulate the way that qubits work um, but obviously because it's a classical computer my mac here whenever i've written these quantum programs it there seems to be a limit of something like 20 to 25 qubits um, which will then start to stress the memory at least of a, of a macbook pro so um that's kind of the the outer edge of of the uh, capability um, but the the cool thing about uh, Q sharp is that it's a, it's a fully formed universal language and it, it does everything that one one day you'll be able to do on real quantum computers um, so you can you can use that to effectively learn how to write quantum algorithms learn how quantum algorithms work and um, because it's Microsoft they you know they're developers 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 I think that was who was it Steve Barmer that said that years ago uh, it's actually a really usable, accessible language. They've written quite a lot of um, libraries for you to look at to see implementations of different algorithms. Uh, and the whole point of what they're saying is uh, because of the way that you structure your program, you use a C-sharp program to call your quantum program. Effectively, you create an instance of the simulator and pass your quantum program to that simulator. So what they're saying is, well, you know, this code, one day, instead of passing an inf uh, an inf uh, the simulator to it, you will pass some sort of reference to some cloud resource that will be the quantum computer so that the programs that you're writing now potentially could be those same programs that you can execute later on. Okay, that's very cool. We'll post uh, all the links in the description below. So if people are interested, they can check them out. Um, and I think that's um, a very nice path that you described for people uh, if they're interested in getting involved with that, uh, how they can yeah. start playing around with the quantum algorithms and learn more about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny how you can actually use a simulator to do those things without <laughs> having an actual uh, quantum computer, but um, yeah. then it gets very expensive depending on what you want to achieve. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how did you get involved with quantum computing? <laughs> yeah, so um, what happened was, uh, I was I was at a conference, uh, I think it was in about March of 2018, so two, two and a half years ago. And uh, I was speaking at this conference and, um, you know, as at the time I worked for ThoughtWorks and ThoughtWorks is big on uh, um, uh, microservices and so on, things like that. And so my talk was about microservices, a very mundane, boring topic, but, uh, you know, I was there talking about microservices. And on the first day of the conference, it was a two-day conference, uh, there was a talk by a person called Alistair, Alistair Connison, who is now a very, very good friend of mine. And it was about quantum computing. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting, um, because I'd heard of quantum computers, and I thought that they were just a theoretical thing. 
Um, so I thought, well, I'll go along. And um, I think his talk was entitled something like the, quant the quantum computers are coming, something like that. So I went to the talk. It was really interesting, but um, I didn't understand much of it. Um, and, you know, maybe it was me. I probably had a bit of a hangover or something. I don't know. But uh, so I thought, well, um, at the speaker's dinner, which was that night, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and talk to this, this chap, Alistair. He was there and, and try and understand a bit more. Um, so I, I tried to speak to Alistair and I did speak to Alistair, but uh, either I think I'm, I'd had a, a few too many beers or perhaps I just was um, not capable of understanding, but I didn't feel like I got too much out of the conversation. And I remember leaving that conversation thinking, uh, ridiculously thinking to myself, oh, I think I could do a better job of explaining quantum computers than Alistair could. And I just thought that, you know, but that's, that's just me. And, and by the way, I, I don't think I can necessarily. So then the following day when I left that conference, um, uh, one of the guys that was one of the organizers said to me, oh, um, I, I run these two conferences in Poland, in Krakow, and they're coming up in a few months. I'd like you to come and talk at them. And I was like, oh, okay. And he said, yeah, would you mind just uh, filling in the, the submission form? Um, but you know, we definitely want you there. And I was like, oh, okay, fine, yeah. So I got back, got back home and I just cut and paste my talk synopsis about microservices and thought, well, they'll ask me to do that because that's why I was there in Vienna. Um, but at the same time, I just, on a whim, I thought, ah, I, I put something together about quantum computing, introduction to quantum computers, because in my head, I thought, how hard can it be? So I submitted that. And then uh, lo and behold, uh, a couple of weeks later, I got these two emails from these two conferences saying, uh, we'd love to love you to come and uh, do this talk on quantum computing. It's a really interesting subject. So I remember saying to one of my colleagues uh, that morning at work, oh, do you fancy doing a hackathon and learning about some quantum computers? Because <laughs> I've got, I've got uh, eight weeks to learn about it. And uh, it turned out that it was, um, I thought it would just be like learning a new software uh, a new programming language like uh, and at the time I'd just been learning about closure because the project I was working on for ThoughtWorks was a closure thing uh, and I just thought well how hard can it be it turns out that it's very hard and it turns out after I a few weeks of trying to read stuff and working it out I realized I actually needed to understand the fundamentals of, of quantum mechanics before, uh, in order to understand how a quantum computer worked and then, so what, I prepared this talk, I did a lot of research. I was lucky enough to find somebody at ThoughtWorks who actually had studied quantum computers at university. So he, he gave me a lot of good help. Um, and uh, also equally luckily at ThoughtWorks at the time, I wasn't working on a client project um, for a, a few weeks there. So I, I had time just to focus on that. And one of uh, the guy that was the head of ThoughtWorks technology at the time told me, okay, just, just go learn about quantum computers. I'll give you a few weeks because, you know, we need to understand it better. So that was a massive help. But then it, I got to Poland and uh, I was desperate to write a, uh, a quantum program using the Microsoft uh, development thing, the Microsoft SDK. And I managed to get it working on the literally uh, an hour or so before the talk. And I, I was over the moon. I was in the, the room going, yes, I've done it. But essentially, the, the talk at that stage was uh, me telling people in the room how hard it was to understand quantum computers and giving an experience report of what I've done. And I remember going to the room and thinking, oh, they haven't put me in one of the main stages, which at this conference, it was a, a big conference um, with you know, thousands of people there. They didn't have me in the main room, which seats sort of 1,500 people. They put me in one of the side rooms, which they told me afterwards had 400 or so people in it. So I was thinking, oh, that's great. There won't be many people there to see that I don't know much about this. But then I got there 10 minutes before the talk and it was already full. There was already people sitting, uh, standing at the back and everywhere. And I was like, oh, God. And um, I remember at the start of the talk, I, I stood in front there and, and I was really, really nervous. And, uh, and I said to the audience, right, has anybody in here actually used a quantum computer? And I put your hands up. And there were two or three uh, people sitting right at the, in the very front row that put their hands up. And I just said to them, okay, so you probably know more about quantum computers than I do. So if I get anything wrong, please feel free to correct me. <laughs> and, and that was it. And, uh, and then, yeah, I, I just carried on uh, learning about it since then. And, and the talk evolved over time to get more and more real content and less and less uh, attempts, probably bad attempts at stand-up comedy. Looks like it worked um, in the end for you, and uh, oh, you, okay. you, forced, you forced yourself to learn about this uh, just by putting your name uh, for that conference. Um, yeah, yeah, that's called conference-driven development. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. 
so thank you very much, James. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, I think we learned a lot of new things today. Uh, where can people find you online? How can they have a chat with you? Um, okay, so um, if you look me up on LinkedIn, uh, that's that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to you. Uh, also on Twitter, um, my Twitter handle is at Running Chair JB. So uh, I think I think George will share that in or something. Put it on the screen when you edit the video. Um, or the, I've got a blog which is a really amateurish looking website because, like every every other technology professional, the last thing I invest in is my own website. So that's www.jamesburney.com. Um, so you can find me on there, message me there, or as I say on Twitter. And yeah, I'm I'm always happy to talk to people and and uh, offer any kind of help or, or advice or whatever. We also have a Slack group uh, if people want to join to have more discussions there. And yeah, I think that concludes our interview with James today. Thank you again so much. It was great having you. Thank you very much, George. Absolute pleasure. Uh, Thank you. Uh, people can. Um, like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment below. And